Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Myra Bloom, and I teach in the English department at Glendon. And we're really, really thrilled. Um, the Glendon English department, in conjunction with uh, Robart, the Robarts Research Center at York, Keel, is thrilled to be presenting this reading and Q&A with Heather O'Neill. Um, I'm going to start by reading out the land acknowledgement, and then we will um, get going. So Glendon, as part of York University, acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Toronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It's now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you to our, our reading with Heather O'Neill, uh, followed by a Q&A. Please feel free, um, if as questions arise, to ask your questions uh, in the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also feel free, unfortunately, because it's a webinar, it's a bit of a, a one-sided situation. But if you'd like to use the chat to introduce yourself, um, say where you're coming from today, um, say anything but nothing um, problematic or pornographic, <laughs> please say it in the chat. Um, and if you have questions, use the Q&A because that's the section that we'll be monitoring um, to that end. So um, I will just go right ahead and I will introduce Heather O'Neill, who really needs no introduction as she's a beloved Canadian treasure. Um, but she is also a novelist, a short story writer, and an essayist. Her most recent best-selling novel, uh, The Lonely Hearts Hotel, won the Paragraph Hugh McLennan Prize for Fiction and was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction and CBC's Canada Reads. Her previous work, which includes Lullabies for Little Criminals and The Girl Who Was Saturday Night, um, a personal favorite, and Daydreams of Angels, has been shortlisted for the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction, the Orange Prize for Fiction and the Scotiabank Giller Prize two years in a row. Um, she's won CBC's Canada Reads and the Danuta Gleed Award. Um, I believe that she is joining us in Montreal from Montreal today where uh, she was born and raised and currently lives with her daughter. Um, and I would just also like to say a quick word about her new book, When We Lost Our Heads. Um, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to take a look at it yet, but it's a fabulous um, fairy tale set in 19th century Montreal that revolves around the friendship and sometimes frenemyship of two girls and later women, uh, Marie Antoine and Sadie Arnett. The two are driven together by their mutual brilliance and respect and then torn apart by an accidental act of violence that sort of has repercussions for the rest of their lives. Um, later, the pair reunite as adults with explosive results. And along the way, um, this, this journey takes place against the backdrop of a Montreal undergoing a social revolution and and explores themes of gender politics and identity, sexuality, class, female friendship, really every important topic is kind of packed into this incredible book. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Heather, uh, who will give us a taste of what she's written. Hi, um, <clears throat> thank you all for joining me. Uh, yeah, I haven't really quite decided what's the best part to read from this book yet. So I'm just going to start and read the very first chapter, which is called The Jewel. In a labyrinth constructed out of a rose bush in the Golden Mile neighborhood of Montreal, two little girls were standing back to back with pistols pointed up towards their chins. They began to count out loud together, taking 15 paces each. Mary Antoine and Sadie Arnett had met in the park on Mount Royal behind their homes when they were little girls of 12 years old. It was 1873. The two of them seemed to have been born with the same amount of thick hair on their heads, except that Sadie had dark brown hair and Mary's was blonde. Sadie had large dark eyes that were almost black, cheekbones that were already high and lips so dark red they looked as though they had makeup on them. Marie had blue eyes and a complexion that looked porcelain and a mouth that was the lightest pink. It was as almost as if they were two dolls that were being marketed to girls, one fair, one dark. That day, Marie had on a white tailored jacket with blue embroidery down the side. It fell just below her knees, revealing her white stockings and pretty blue, blue leather shoes. Sadie had on a burgundy hat with a black ruffle. 
It was about the size of a cupcake. It was propped on her head uselessly, but at least it didn't take away from the impression her black velvet coat with burgundy buttons made. She had small black shoes with black bows on the toes. The pistols had roses engraved on the handles. A maid looked down from the second story window. She was buttoning up her chemise and whistling. From her perspective, she could see into the labyrinth and it's clearing in the middle. At first, she doubted what she was actually seeing. It did not seem possible at all. There's always something surreal about, how ch about children embarking on something dangerous. They are oblivious to the danger. They act as though they are about to defy all the laws of physics. For a moment, the adult is suspended in the realm of childhood disbelief, but the maid broke the spell. She ran down the stairs with only her drawers on her chemise half undone. Her red hair flew behind her as though she were carrying a torch. She ran through the labyrinth screaming. Finally, she arrived there. She stood in the middle and opened her mouth to tell the girls to stop at the precise moment they both spun around and fired their guns at each other. As the two bullets hit the maid and she fell to the ground, the words alerting the girls to their idiocy were forever silenced. Thank you so much. Um, as you say, that's the opening chapter of the novel, this sort of um, fateful moment that sets so many things in motion for us in the book. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the sort of French Revolution echoes of the of the book, and um, in particular about the carry uh, the character of Marie Antoine, who you've talked about, you know, being somewhat inspired by by Marie Antoinette. She's kind of a bratty character, but a sympathetic one. Um, and I wanted to know what inspired her character, um, and uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about her? Oh, Marie Antoine. Yes, she's one of um, the central characters of the book. Probably the first one that I conceived of in this whole, um, when I was kind of coming up with characters, because I usually come up with characters first and do kind of um, little scenes with them to see how they work and just so I can get to know them. And I always try and like, I wait for that point when the character starts doing some effort themselves. And I'm like, why am I doing all the work? Why don't you speak to me and Tell me something about yourself. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. But um, so she was kind of inspired by Mary Antoinette and she is, who's a very, you know, problematic figure and um, Marie herself is problematic. So, cause she, I mean, I really adored her and I wanted her to be this kind of um, little beacon that is so, she kind of, she's so, good at all these Victorian mannerisms and all the little Victorian things that women are supposed to be good at, but she's so good at them that it's almost tongue in cheek and ironic. And there's always something unsettling when someone's too good at something. Anyhow, but I don't know how far you want me to go in because she, she ends up um, through the book, she progresses and becomes this more and more powerful figure and takes over these factories and starts creating this monopoly. And she really, um, she starts to, although she has some wonderful feminist traits in that she is very ambitious and um, she pursues her life goals, like above all else at the same time, she, um, she has this very corrupt view of feminism where she's just, um, she kind of this girl boss extraordinaire where she kind of, um, the other women in the book start very much reacting against her form of feminism because they're like, you're in control now. Why aren't you dismantling the patriarchy instead of um, becoming more brutal than any man who was in this position before? So, um, She's a frustrating character, but and because she kind of had that element of Marie Antoinette, who was also a frustrating character, who she came to France came when she was 14 years old, was sold off in marriage, was absolutely adored. But then everybody kind of, when people turned against her, I was always fascinated by how obsessed they were with her sexuality and how they went after her just being a woman and um, always accusing her of these crimes of of um, really heinous sexual activity and in incest and anything they could think of was thrown on the body of Mary Antoinette. So um, that's sort of where she came from. 
Super interesting. Yeah, the the sort of revisionist history of of Marie Antoinette. Um, it's fascinating to kind of go back and really understand who she was and how much of a disservice history has really done her. And so it was exciting to see you kind of um, taking a slightly different tack and engaging with some of the the themes. Um, And that actually leads me to something else I wanted to ask you about, which has to do with the fact that this is a historical novel, but so many of its themes are obviously incredibly relevant to the present moment. And um, I love the line where you're talking about um, the female pharmacist, Jeanne Pauline, uh, and you say that she had cures for ailments male doctors did not believe in. And obviously, you know, it's this historical problem of, of women getting incredibly short shrift in, in this um, 19th century story. But obviously, that's an enduring issue with so many of women's problems being so misunderstood. And so many of the topics in this book um, are so contemporary, the idea of sexual violence against women, um, the sort of unknown country of women's sexuality and desire, the question of gender roles and gender politics. And so I was wondering if you could just maybe talk a little bit about how you sort of um, think about these, you know, themes from the present and why you decided to explore them in this historical context and um, how the sort of past and the present merge in your thinking around these issues. Yeah, so yeah, exactly as you said, what the book is dealing with um, all questions that I've been kind of engaging with in the past um, five years or so, and that are very current and we're kind of working on as a society. So, but then I put them in a Victorian context to kind of see how they would play out. And um, which is an interesting thing. And I think one of the, um, I had been, you sort of start, like collecting images and just ideas for a book before you start working on it. And in Im- images that I, that I was so fascinated were um, of women at that time in their undergarments and particularly of women in the, their crinolines, which is those large cages that they put on before the dresses. And it was, it was, they were so fascinating to me because they were all these images of women like literally in cages. And then I just thought it would be so much fun to look at those questions in, in the Victorian era when what a woman was, was being sort of circumscribed in all these manuals and texts and even down to how you would, you know, take something out of your pocket or walk down a hallway there was ways for a woman to do it. And the idea you could be a perfect woman and what, and gender roles were just so um, being set in stone. So I thought it was fun to have these revolutionary characters who kind of came right before the first wave of feminist, uh, feminism and were questioning this and what that would be like when you don't have the words for it, when you don't have sort of the modern writing around it, like how it would look like for these very rebellious women who just have this, um, as Alice Munro would say, the spark of life in them, how they would, uh, how they would react to these types of conundrums and queries that I had. So it was just funner. It was just like, it's, it it seemed, it would just seem perfect for me. And it originally, like I had seen this um, painting at time of a, of an ice ball and there were some young girls and they were dressed in French revolutionary characters, which was popular at the time. And I was like, oh, what if I had these girls actually in acting, acting like French revolution characters, like they never took the costumes off and they were just in uh, the real world acting in these maniacal over the top ways and how that would fit in Victorian society. Super fascinating. I feel like I could ask you so many questions about this book, Um, but I know that not everyone here will have read it yet. Um, And I know that also a lot of people are here because they, they love your, your previous works from lullabies, the girl who was Saturday night. I know lonely hearts hotel is a kind of fan favorite in my 
in one of my English classes. Um, so actually, um, I there are two students from from my fourth year seminar on Canadian literature on Quebec literature in particular who want to ask you a question, and um, I'm going to turn it over to them. And while they're asking, hopefully that will prompt some of you in the audience to formulate some questions as well. So as things arise, please feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, so Maya, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask your question. Awesome. Yeah, first of all, um, I just want to say thank you, Heather, so much for being here. I'm such a huge fan um, and I love your novels. So just wanted to get that out of the way first. Um, so my question for you is um, it specifically is focused on uh, Lonely Hearts Hotel, but also some of the central themes in your other novels. Um, so something that draws me to your novels is the portrayal of childhood as something that is simultaneously explicit yet innocent. Um, an example that comes to mind is the way that Rose views sex as a kind of game or how Kiro's thieving is represented so playfully in the Lonely Hearts Hotel. Um, how do you manage to create child characters who are dealing with such heavy and mature issues yet maintain their naivete and innocence? Um, how do I do? I mean, I think it's all like, Probably it comes down to the language in a lot of ways. I think I've worked really hard on creating this tone. And I think it's funny because when you're in, when you first start writing, you just uh, start, I mean, it's like your, your pen, it's like a sweater is unraveling because so much junk comes out of it. And like, and you're just trying to find your voice. And that was something that I just responded to and it seemed to capture the, the universe the way that I, that I had perceived it as a child and what I found exciting about it and all the, I think for me seeing the world that way and being fascinated in it, even though I had grown up in this really kind of abusive um, environment was what was kind of my salvation and just finding poetry in life. So I kind of built a universe um, that mirrors that sort of feeling that I had. Um, yeah, and I, and then, you know, it's always kind of your trick the, you trick the reader in a way. It's like humor, like humor, when you have something funny, it just opens someone's heart and then you can um, tell them the most, you know, provocative or unsettling things, but because you've made them laugh, then they you give them like a more human way to respond to it, as opposed to just um, just having that sort of closing off feeling that when you kind of encounter somebody else's trauma. But I mean, that's what like stand up comedy is all about. They're just like deliver you their trauma in the most funny, ridiculous manner, and you're able to. Um, you're just able to internalize it in a way and, and understand it in a way that doesn't take away any of the humanity because no one wants to be pitied. It's just, it's as an experience and this is my life. And even though it may seem dark, like it's just as full of grace as any other life. Thanks, Maya, and thanks, Heather, for that answer. Um, I'm going to, just because I'm I'm seeing that people are a bit slow to, to ask in the Q&A before I turn it over to our next student, Claire, I'm just going to take the liberty of jumping on that to ask you something I've been curious about, which has to do with tone in your writing. So um, your first book, Lullabies for Little Criminals, is quite gritty, um, and it's, it's, it's darker. And um, I find that kind of as your writing and as your voice has evolved, you've been moving towards a kind of more almost stylized, almost fairy tale like like quality to your work. And I'm wondering if you see that same evolution and um, yeah, how you kind of feel that your tone has evolved. I'm thinking specifically about kind of Lonely Hearts Hotel and When We Lost Our Heads, mm. which to me are sort of the most like, they're gritty and they're dark, but they're much more whimsical, I think, than than something like lullabies. So yeah, do you do you see that evolution for yourself? Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's like my own evolution. It's like watching a child grow, like because it's so incremental. But I think one of the 
Yeah, with with lullabies for little criminals and the girl with Saturday night, I had I wrote them both in first person, so it was sort of me internalizing a character and speaking through their voice. And of course, you choose characters. This was in your first book, or anyways, I did a character that who kind of mirrored my sensibilities and everything that baby is excited by, something that I'm excited by. But um, then I've moved just more into. I started, I think the shift happened when I moved into third person because then there's, then it's almost like me standing back having a puppet show and showing this universe. So it's like, I'm still there because the the voice is recognizable, but um, I feel like I've had enough to say from my own voice and I couldn't repeat that. So I've kind of creating these strange like it always feels like I'm in a theatrical production now whereas before I often um I would just live it but now it's like these moments where I'm staging it like Lonely Hearts Hotel felt very much like a like a theater set to me and just the way I had the clowns and the way they kind of are always bumping into each other and doing clownish things and this one um yeah, I mean, as you see, there's a dollhouse, but I was also involved with dollhouses in the play. So there is that feeling of Victorian dollhouses and these, um, it's almost like a little puppet theater, but um, so yeah, it is, it, it's just always a different sort of, when, from when I go from first person to third person, it's just such a different world for me. Super interesting. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Claire for a question. Go ahead, Claire. Hi there. So um, I was, uh, we're in class, we're studying quite a lot about Canadian literature, and it's got the cogs turning in my head to um, think about kind of the Canadian ethos. And uh, after a conversation with some of my fellow uh, readers and bibliophiles, we've concluded that books considered for or awarded the Giller Prize are most often of kind of a melancholy nature. Um, there seems to be an undercurrent in Canadian literature where writers lay themselves bare and delve into the secrets of the unconscious mind, revealing the unsavory parts that exist within us all. Do you consider this to be a part of the Canadian ethos? If so, why? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Like, how would you see that as different like specifically to can lit you see that or do you see that uh, and you see that different from world literature or American literature or like wouldn't they all because um, you're saying which ones <sighs> that's a hard question sorry for the complex question no, um, I'm just not, uh, okay so let me see it in terms of can lit do I see that it's it's um very much looking under I think I think so I think what it what's kind of been interesting about Canadian literature of the past I don't know we'll say like 10 years or what is the the explosion of diverse voices and different types of experiences from within Canada which I find so fascinating like there's been so much work from Scarborough Ontario <laughs> these magnificent novels where it was I didn't even really know about it and it was not on the literary map. So um, I find there's just so much unexplored of Canadian literature. So these identities popping up in these different voices um, are wonderful, but I don't know. I mean, I speak for myself when, when I like to kind of look for those unexplored dark places. And I mean, the fun thing about being an author is you you look for the most unusual dark spots and then relay them back to the reader for their and as something that they can find themselves in because there's just commonality with the human experience and that's why I like um having I mean for one of the reasons I like putting a lot of provocative sexual stuff in my work and and counterintuitive uh, feelings about, you know, rage and friendship and just dark, dirty things, because then I know the reader will have to locate them within themselves. So I think um, I see 
the writer sort of as a provocateur and making all those emotions and sensibilities alive. And then, so yeah, then people, when they have those sort of completely different backgrounds from you and they start poking these, all these new buttons. And that's why sometimes your brain just starts lighting up when you read a book and these emotions, because they're just making you locating foreign experiences, but then locating the emotion that is similar in yours. I have no idea if I'm making any sense, but you asked me an abstract question. <laughs> so I give an abstract answer. You're reminding me, Heather, of something um, the Italian writer Elena Ferrante said when she said um, she she wrote this in in a, uh, an interview I think it was that's included in the book Frantumalia, and she said something like, "I like to detail everything that's alive and wriggling that I pull up," and I love that idea of the writer like pulling up the, the things out of the like ocean floor that are alive and wriggling, and I think you do that in your writing, but in um, you know, it's always tempered with the sort of fantastical nature. And that's, what's amazing about your writing is that it, you know, it's, it's often incredibly dark, but very light at the same time. And this, this relates directly to a question that we have in the Q and a, she says, I love, I love the lonely hearts hotel. Did you consciously incorporate themes of addiction and sexual abuse? If so, why, and what inspired you to write that book? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting when you uh, write, after you've written a few books and you just realize you have these themes or things that keep coming back to you. Um, so I, so uh, yeah, addiction just kind of repeats in my novels and sexual abuse. And I think those were, um, those, were just events in my own life that were so, there was like, a, you know, it's like these moments in your life where it, you, if it, you're not, life is a novel where you turn the page over so that you can return to and, and you underline it and then you put stars on the side, but you're always trying to comprehend it. So um, I'm trying to think if that, if the question is like, is the question like, why do I particular, why have, why am I inhabited by those themes particularly? Um, I guess, cause I had been subjected to abuse uh, when I was young. So that kind of the way, like, yeah, I've just such, it kind of never goes away because you always have these in different interpretations of it from different ages. And then like how I see it now in my forties was so different than my twenties. And so it's interesting, like it just, it becomes this different kind of beast. And um, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I was like, I'm supposed to overshare here or anything, but, and, and addiction was also like my daughter's father had died of a fentanyl overdose. So, and I think I lived with um, that kind of addiction in my life. So, it, and the power that it has to, it's just a haunting power when you see it take somebody and them just be completely at its mercy and what it is, the question of, is it something, a sense of, is it a weakness that you're born with that you're more, uh, have a larger um, propensity for falling into addiction? And is it a softness? And is it um, this in, inability to kind of, deal with life and just deal with the fact that we're all losers and terrible, like um, we're all disappointed. But I find that um, in my own experience with um, addiction in my life, it has to do with a certain, a certain vulnerability and inability to cope with the reality. And that was so, and then I had the figure of Caro who has such um, a weakness in him, which and that kind of, it just seemed to me he was almost born an addict because he had um, just this softness in him and this inability to rage. Like Rose is able to externalize everything that happens to her and says, this is a systematic flaw that, you know, it's because of capitalist whatever and sexism that I'm in the predicament that I am. And, but Caro is just, 
just get sad about things. And so he just looks for, he's constantly in search of a quick fix for his sadness, which is sort of all consuming for him. I mean, he's this, the sad clown for me. It's interesting. So many of your books are structured around the relationship between duos and it's always like the sort of um, qualities of one that act as a foil for the qualities of the other. And um, yeah, it's, that's a really, uh, to me, that's such an interesting and fun part of your writing and the the connection that you're making to your kind of own experience um, brings a new dimension of that to me in terms of, yeah, kind of seeing um, your, your daughter's father go through this experience and, um, you know, what you've drawn from it. And so, yeah, I guess to kind of move from the personal to the research, um, we have a question here from an anonymous attendee about the research that you do. So they ask, what books did you read when doing your research on Marie Antoinette, the Marquis de Sade, Jean-Pauline Marat and Robespierre and all the wonderful characters you drew parallels to? How long do you spend in your research and reading phase? Um, and are there any gems that stood out and inspired you during that time? Um, yeah, this book was funny because it was like two historical periods that I was researching. It's set in the Victorian era, but then it um, has these sort of like scaffolding of the French Revolution, which happened in the 1700s. So um, it's kind of like two parallel layers of research. But I, th- I think also like whenever you choose to write a book about a certain time period, you've been researching it for years. And um, I was always... Um, I was always so fascinated by the characters and the figures from the French Revolution because they were so over the top and they were all, um, a lot of orators or writers who had just kind of like Robespierre or Danton and they had taken these works of the enlightenment and tried to manifest them. And they all kind of went crazy and then just started these reigns of terror and just the power went to their heads and just displays of, of grandiose perversity that I, I mean, it was just so fascinating to read, especially Robespierre who had started off as this orphan with, um, you know, no way to make his, you know, nothing, nothing um, going for him other than he had this uh, wonderful way of speaking. And even as a child, he was able to deliver these speeches. And then he went off and like um, instigated this insane revolution. <laughs> so I was interested in that, but I never knew um, kind of, I didn't have a place for it because all the figures were men and it was so, and women's rights actually went backwards that are quite a bit during the French revolution. So it was all about men and breaking class, but it wasn't really seeing women as people. So, um, so I had all that kind of background reading and um, I was always very curious about uh, the Marquis de Sade also. And um, who, if you, I mean, he's one of these writers who everybody kind of knows the con, the sub, the content of what he does, but they don't actually read his novels, which I recommend that you don't. <laughs> they're like these, these just so pornographic and violent and disgusting and uh, misogynistic and um, just grotesque in every way. But he was, um, he's been picked up by a lot of, he had such an influence on the avant-garde and also feminism. And a lot of feminists saw him as interesting because his female characters who are engaged in all sorts of um, wild sexual activity were not at all interested in being mothers. And that fascinated people like Simone de Beauvoir and Angela Carter, how the Marquis de Sade had somehow seen um, women not as this vessel to just, uh, have babies. What was I saying? So anyways, I had just been reading up on those guys for a long time. And then, um, so then, but then more of my hands-on research was looking at uh, trying to rebuild the Victorian era in Montreal and the upper class, the golden mile was a little bit easier just because the buildings are still there. They kind of keep records of that, but the squalid mile, which didn't even have a name. I just called it squalid mile myself. Cause I, I love to have just filthy and crazy it was, but it's all been, I mean, it was built just in matters of weeks as you had so many immigrants coming and factory factories being built and you had to have all these houses for the factory workers. So this neighborhood went up really quickly. And um, yeah, it was just, and details that I found that was so fascinating. Just um, one of the things that I had read was if you, if you had a 
like a baby was born in that neighborhood at that time, the survival rate was only 50%. So that kind of, um, so the way babies are treated in my novel is so different because they're only these possibly temporary tiny visitors or they make girl. I didn't, so um, that was good. And, and just the, um, the factories actually, um, I found just wonderful information about women working in factories and little girls working in factories, which was amazing to me because we see the industrial revolution. Um, it's always presented as such uh, a male activity with all the men in the factories but there were just, the factories were filled with little girls who used to have to climb into machines and clean them between, it was so horrifically dangerous. We had all these like little girls and that just, it in my mind, like, because I have that sensibility, I immediately it just seemed like a ballet to me. I was like, how beautiful. These little girls jumping in and out and being like having their fingers chopped off. So, um, so that was something that went into the book. So it's just little details like that from the Victorian world that I was, I went down to the museum and was reading sort of any book I could find on Montreal and Victorian times, but it was very difficult because it's sort of not um, an era that has really been described in Montreal history. It's, to, it's more like, even when we imagine it, we start having like these British memories. That's interesting. So it sounds like you sort of had the concept of the novel and then you did quite a lot of research before you really started to write is that yeah accurate? that's all that's what I always do like I have it in my head and then I start writing like the outline but then um all sorts of problems come up in the writing like I'm like do they turn as she has to go to the bathroom what exactly <laughs> does she do at this point like how does she even get her clothes off or do they have like um, running water in the houses. So little things like that and all the, all the tiny details, like if you move a chair, you have to know what kind of chair it is. So, and when they get dressed, you have to know what exactly they would be wearing in 1873. So little things like that, just to fix it up. And then when you're looking for those details, you always find these amazing, inspiring things. And you're like, I have to put that in. That's a great segue into something that I was wondering about. Um, he wants to know about fashion and dress in your books. Um, he makes the point that it's very detailed in your books. And um, the question as formulated is how does it help you move the story or themes forward? But, you know, we could open the question up and just ask you more broadly, like, um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that kind of fashion and clothing and the role that that plays in your writing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just like one of my big, thing like art films that I've always like I was just obsessed with fashion magazines growing up and just I still am like fashion photography and the sort of um absolute circus like what they can throw in it's so uh I just find it wonderful anyways I find I I, I do that's one of the things I always thought when people are like what would you do if you weren't a writer I was I always thought I would like to be a stylist for one of these fashion magazines where you just send out your list I'll have like 10 rabbits a top hat a dress that goes 17 feet that way um but fashion is very important in my books and um my characters are often narcissists and very vain so they're also they kind of are interested in how they present themselves to the world. But the Victorian era, um, as I was saying with the crinolines, it was really, it, it provided, um, it was like a really rich resource because it was so metaphorical about the themes, like how many layers women had to put on and the, and of course corsets and um, that didn't like would make you pass out. And then these absurd dresses, like, so my characters are always toppling downstairs or they're always catching on fire and stuff. And um, just that, and the amount, the amount of layers of clothes that a woman would have to take off before she was naked and what that meant and the kind of layers of um, absurd, like not real femininity, but these um, enforced femininity that she would have to put on. And um, then also the cot, one of the, I really enjoyed to doing the, the, what everyone was gonna be wearing in the brothel because on the one hand they are 
they're pretending to be these upper class ladies, but of course nobody believes it. So it's kind of cheap. So I wanted um, that sort of poor women dressing up as rich women vibe. And um, I mean, and there's this, there's a chapter that I kept like kind of almost getting, it was almost getting cut out of the book so many times. It's a chapter where they're putting on stockings and the two girls. And that was about, um, I mean, Victorian stockings, first of all, are just so beautiful. But the, when the girls are this, um, Marie and Sadie, who are best friends are trying on their stock, these stockings together one after another. And it was just the sensuality of female friendship. And, and part of the book, I wanted to really eroticize female friendship, how, there's that sensuousness to it and just touching and feeling and like you just sleep in the same bed and go in baths. And, and I think there's something, I found that so exquisite. So when they kind of slide on these stockings that are as thin as another layer of skin, but make you so smooth and their little legs, it's like, uh, so that was um, an expression of the physicality of female love for one another and friendship. Yeah, I love that dimension of the book, um, that the fact that, yeah, these women are, um, they're connected to each other sexually, but as you say, it's, it's a kind of erotic, physical, tangible mm -hmm. connection. Um, and that's, that's sort of perhaps uh, connects to what I was wondering about in the chat, um, about whether you were trying in depicting these, these relationships or, or elsewhere to sort of say something about the psychology of um, women of the day, or are you kind of more interested in making a commentary about the contemporary moment? Geneva is asking in terms of kind of feminist issues, but it seems, you know, in that, in that kind of commentary on, on women's relationship, there's sort of like a, a kind of trans historical dimension to it. Um, do you sort of, how important, I guess I'm, I'm just going to take the liberty of, of reformulating this question to my own end. How important was it to you to kind of say something about like women's friendship, for instance, or about feminist more issues, issues more broadly? Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing with any, yeah, I, I was trying to speak like to the contemporary moment with everything I was saying. And even, I mean, the absurdity of even a historical novel is always like even if you're writing about a historical novel and you're being as realistic as possible, you're only select you're selecting details that appeal to the our present sensibility. So historical novel is all a lie. You're just telling the his you're telling a present moment, um, but using the scaffolding to that a scaffolding that will kind of highlight the contemporary issues, like in a more um, fascinating or shocking or fun way. So um, yeah, I was definitely speaking about, um, yeah, like what female friendship is to me and that, um, I don't know, I keep forgetting. Every time I start talking, I forget by the time I'm done what the question was. But yeah, it was more about, um, it was supposed to be as can very in the moment. Yeah. and wants to know um, kind of about the specific point about the fact that this book isn't centered on um, the very important Victorian task of pursuing a man. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, uh, what was writing that juxtaposition but what was writing that juxtaposition between the Victorian expectation of women only needing to exist to marry and a whole book about a female entanglement like? Oh yeah, that was what was so fun about the Victorian period too because in this book I just decided that I would um I was just going to center women which is an odd thing to do in Victorian times because the women their whole everything they did their entire education was not so that they could you know pursue professions it was so that they could be uh, a more um entertaining wife and you could listen to what your husband was saying like everything was just aimed towards the marriage towards the marriage and having children and then these were all the women in this book who are I mean they come together because of their insane ambitions some of them are um great wonderful ambitions and some of them like all ambitions there's like there's always um an edge of perversity in any ambition like why you want something is never truly for the good of why you want it it's just and it always involves like a touch of narcissism and um, ridiculous motives. Um, 
so anyways, I want, so these women were, they meet because of that, because they're so, they have goals, they have these missions, they have these ambitions, and they know that are, if they were to get married, it would just end that they would not um, be able to pursue them. They would sort of be under the, everything they do, their husband would just be their, their king, whatever. And, uh, so lost my train of thought. Yeah. But that was really fun because I was like, I didn't even know how it would go. If I had this novel that only centered women and I took, um, romance completely out of it, there's no real, um, driving relationship with a man in it. And, and I was curious how they would fill up that space and how they would figure out their lives and would, um, without the institution of marriage or motherhood and they and yeah to my delight they had just had no problem with it. <laughs> it was not even the question because they're so obsessed with one another that um they have no time for romance they're just not interested in it. they're particularly not interested in what the victorian world offers them in terms of romance totally yeah um we have a question that kind of goes a little bit uh, backwards in our conversation, but I think is interesting. Um, an anonymous attendee thanks you for being so vulnerable. And I think you too, it's always, um, you know, a risk to sort of tell your story to a faceless crowd. Um, but this question is about whether it's hard for you to, to separate your own experiences from the experience of your characters, or do you welcome this inextricability? Mm. I think, I think I welcome it because I always find I find out so much about myself too with the characters. Like when I was writing Rose, um, cause the story of Lonely Hearts Hotel had come from this, uh, a, like a short story kind of thing I had written when I was very young. I think I was 22 and I kind of refound it. And I liked those characters and then so I was reworking it. And then Piero was sort of as I had conceived him when I was younger, that sort of um, sleepy, handsome man, <laughs> whatever he is. But then Rose, I had originally like created her as this kind of just beautiful gangster mall who um, just kind of is languid. I didn't even think I had a personality for her. And then anyways, when I started creating her, she just became so full of rage and so angry. And it was almost like she was reacting towards me. It was like, you're just not going to make me this silly little gangster mall. I'm actually going to be the city's like most ferocious gangster. But also in creating Rose, then I just, <coughs> I realized how much anger I had in myself. And I was like, wow, like it's coming out of someplace. And so it was like Rose enabled all this sort of rage to come out of me. And then I, I just felt like a fuller person once I had created this being that that whole um, somehow. And I mean, because we create parameters for the self and our own personality that sometimes limit us. So then when you create these other characters, they allow um, parts of you that you haven't explored to fully like live, you know, like some. And so in this novel, like someone like Sadie is just um, she decides to pursue like all sexual perversion, which is like, I don't need to do, but it's fun to do through Sadie, you know? And then you just understand certain things about yourself and you're like, wow, where am I coming up with this stuff? So what I'm essentially saying is every character somehow springs from me. And I, and um, I hope, I do hope they share my character traits, but what I really love is when they share character traits that I'm sort of secretive about or that are deep, some other, some other self inside me. Yeah. It's like, as Freud said, every Heather O'Neill character is the fulfillment of a wish. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. He didn't say that, but he would have, if he were alive. <laughs> um, is wondering if writing has become easier for you over time, I guess, maybe presuming that um, it, it is hard. I'm sure you, I'm sh writing is hard. I'm sure mm -hmm. you find it hard too, but yeah. What um, has it become easier and also what inspires you to write? Um, I think it has, I don't know, it's hard to say, but one thing I noticed is that I think I used to actually, um, 
actively try and inspire myself. So I would just kind of surround myself. Like I would always have um, bulletin boards just full of like photographs and whatever I was trying to build, like a collage of the aesthetic of the novel, like a mood board and stuff like that. And then I would look at it and I would just have things that would kind of provoke me. But I feel like I don't actually need that anymore. It's just, it, um, it's almost, but then I just realized it was like Dumbo's feather and I can actually access those because there's always this level, you have this magical thinking that somehow you have to feel like this amazing, great feeling when you're writing. So, and then I, and I just, it's just like a job kind of, like it's something you toil through and sometimes your feelings towards it don't match with what's on the page. Like sometimes I just think I'm having the most extraordinary writing day. And I'm like, I can't believe myself. <laughs> Look at this. This is great. Then I read it back and it's just, it was like nonsense. I was like, clearly I was just in too good a mood when I was writing. And then other times I'll just struggle and struggle with a piece. And it just, every word seems like it's wearing like um, the, you know, shoes on the wrong feet. But then when I read it back, it's, it's, I was like, oh, wow, I really captured something. So um, I think I don't fool myself as much. Or maybe I just don't need that. So it, in some aspects, I think it's become easier. I've, I've definitely have an easier time building um, plot, which is um, which is a great skill to have. <laughs> it's your first novel. It's just like, I don't know. And then there was a dog and the dog was loud and there was a sun and the sun was radiant. Okay. How do I build a plot with all these um, things? Totally. Um, a lot of people are curious to know what authors are inspiring you. Um, right at the moment, what am I reading? I'm reading, um, I've really gotten into that Danish writer who's recently been published, Tove Detlevsen. Am I pronouncing your name right? Do you know? That's how I say it in my head, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is like first time I'm saying out loud. Um, she wrote this trilogy of um, memoirs that they've just recently published and uh, just the way she I, I love that um, when people write just honestly about themselves and they don't pot like she just brings up these dirty crazy details and um, it's just uh, I love her voice um, so yeah that's the I've been reading all her novels now because I just discovered her because she's huge in um, Denmark. But then she, uh, I guess she wasn't really known here and she commit, she has some fab, one of those like crazy writer <laughs> biographies too. And then it's like, like, oh my gosh, she's institutionalized. She killed herself. But then it's like every now and then it just seems like she like crawled out of the school or <laughs> just like wrote some, just absolutely eloquent thought um, and so penetrative. So I don't know. That's someone I like. Are there books that in the past have been like very influential on your thinking or writing? Um, yeah, of course. What has been, um, it's so funny when you always, ask, when you ask that question and then um, it depends on the, like, um, Jean Reese was a big influence on actually Lonely Hearts Hotel with the um, chorus girls because she was um, actually a chorus girl herself, oddly enough. Um, I read this crazy book. I don't know why I keep bringing up dead people. Like, I'm gonna someone. Um, I also discovered this book called All My Cats, and it's this Czech writer, and he just, he, after some fame, it's a memoir too. He go, he moves to a house in the country, like this little cabin in the country, but he's always lived in the city and there's just feral cats everywhere. So it's a memoir about him murdering the cats and it's really grotesque, but then it ends up being this sort of, um, this kind of, these pensées on like, on guilt. And, and somehow he links it back to whether Czech, the Czech Republic was actually more guilty. Um, in the Nazi era, then they sure. 
I don't know. I'm going on. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I'm thinking but about like how fitting that is considering how much of an appearance cats make, particularly in the girl. Who Saturday Night. You are also a writer who um, puts a lot of weight on cat symbolism. <laughs> um, and I'm just going on and on. The new Sheila Hetty is interesting. That comes out today. Um, I really like the way she, she plays with um, philosophy and did you like that book? The new one? I read, it. I read it as well. Actually, I just reviewed it for The Walrus. And it almost, as you were talking about your writing process, I was thinking about my own, which is deeply dysfunctional and fraught. And um, that book like nearly drove me to the brink of madness and trying to figure out what I thought about it. So I'm particularly curious to hear what you thought about it. Um, I'm going to read your article because it's one of those books too. It's like, it's what you, when you're reading it, this is something interesting I find about books. Like some books, when you read them and then like a month later, they're the same thing as when you read them. And then some books are radically different. And so, and also I find it's fun with memory, like what books stick with you. And then, so it almost seems like people should review books like two months after you've read them. And then it's like, if you don't remember anything, then it's like, you shouldn't review the book. But what you remember and what sticks with you the book is actually the sort of power of the book. Yeah, Sheila had a really, um, one of the themes of that book is sort of like the criticism of criticism. And mm -hmm. she was talking about another writer and how like critics always think they have to stand above the book and like have some kind of definitive statement about it. And she was talking about how egotistical that is. And I tried to write a, a review that just said that. And then the editor said, it was unacceptable to just say that, that you actually had to have a take. And so then I ended up trying to have a take. And anyway, I, yeah, I, I'm curious, actually, maybe as a final question, because we're almost out of time. Um, what is your relationship to criticism? I mean, I think you're so beloved. I don't know if you've ever received a negative review, but do you read your reviews? Do you internalize them? What's that relationship like? I usually just skim them. I don't know why, but I just... I'll read like the first, I usually read the first line and the last line. And then actually if it, and then if they're good, kind of good, the first and the last line's good, then you're fine. And you can read the inside of a review because sometimes they always do this thing where it's like, um, it might be a great review until the last line. <laughs> Throw in like um, a lot of um, something, but like, unfortunately, like blah, blah. So once you read the first one and end one, but I do think I find criticism lately has just been fascinating. Um, it's such a beautiful, I mean, I love, and because so many people are publishing like essays online, there's, it's so much, it's so much easier to access essays so that people put more time in because if they have a better readership and just, I don't know, you just have these thinkers like uh, waxing just like way too deep on like an episode of succession or some you know book like with the with the latest um Hannah Yana Gehera novel which was so peculiar to me because so many reviews came out and everyone was loving the reviews just because the reviews were critical and it was like an interesting piece of critical writing although no one had read the book yet and I was like there's no way you guys have read the book I'm like it's 700 pages I'm like going through it I listened to the full audiobook oh yeah so let's talk about that too in our next sure, that one it's so it's like that's a book I can't even tell you give you a, a critique of it because I'm only I'm only 400 pages in and I have no idea what's happening but that was like a that, that was this this moment when it just kind of spawned all this crazy criticism that had nothing whatsoever to do with the book so it was criticism on criticism that one's fascinating too, because the reviews are so polarized. Half the reviews are like raves and half the reviews are pans. And with that one, I was enjoying the book so much that I couldn't look at any of the criticisms because I, I just didn't want to have the experience determined for me. And yeah, I can only imagine as a writer, it's like you put something out into the world and then you just wait for people to receive it. However, yeah. they're going to receive it. I can imagine that could potentially get in your head. Um, I kind of, I don't know if I do, like when I finish the book, it always seems to me like 
I can't possibly imagine when I'm finally done it. But I know I'm done a piece like anything, an essay or a novel. It's when I just hate it completely. And then I'm finished. I'm like, I cannot believe anybody on earth could possibly ever like this novel. <laughs> so ridiculous. I don't know what it's about. It's a lot of words. It's too much work. So, um, yeah, you just send it out. At that point, you send it out in the world and it's such an unknowable thing to you. Even though you've created it, you don't know what a book is until other people have read it. So you have no idea how it's going to affect people, how people are going to respond to it, if they're going to find it funny, if they're going to find it like overly dark, if, what they're going to make of it. So it's funny when a book first comes out and people are like, what your, is your book about? And I'm like, I have no idea yet. I have to wait till people tell me what's it about. Then I'll let you know. Totally. Okay. Well, that's a great note to end on. Um, we're two minutes over time. Thank you so, so much, Heather. It's been a true joy to talk with you and, um, thank you to, <laughs> thank you to all of you for being here. Um, yeah. And everyone should read when we lost our heads. It's a really, really wonderful romp. Thank you, Heather. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>